And Chris, you just let me know when I when I should go. I think we've got a uh, a great cohort of uh, fans and the audience, and the speakers are all here. So I think you're ready to go. Dave, you're ready to start. Fabulous. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to the Jim Hay Memorial Award Symposium. My name is Walter Herzog from the University of Calgary, and I'm going to be moderating this particular session. And um, all I need to say as a moderator is that at the bottom of your Zoom box, you have a chat box. And if you have questions uh, for the speakers, then you can leave that. Uh, pick my name, Walter Herzog, and send me the question that you have during the talk or after the talk, because we'll have about five minutes or so after each talk for one or two little questions. So to put that into the chat box directly to me so that I can see it. So with this out of the way, I would like to welcome you all. Uh, the Jim Hay Memorial Award is in honor of Jim Hay, who I consider probably the most prominent sport biomechanist of the 20th century. Uh, the Jim Hay Memorial Award from the American Society is recognizing outstanding career accomplishment and it's awarded to an investigator who has conducted exemplary research in the area of sports and exercise biomechanics. Uh, the awardee is selected by an awards committee and this year uh, I was helped by Jill McNick Gray and Chris Haas to do that. Thank you very much for their help. And since 2017, the Jim Hay Award has a has a, a symposium format, which it didn't have before. And um, the awardee is asked to put together this symposium with uh, some colleagues and friends and people who talk on similar, uh, want to talk about similar topics. And so loosely speaking, this symposium is uh, about probabilistic simulation in biomechanics. And as you all know, uh, the Jim Hay Memorial awardee this year is Ton van den Bokert who is the Parker Hennepin Endowed Chair, is Director of Graduate Program in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Cleveland State University. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Ton. We have a very long history. I've known him uh, since uh, our student days uh, when he got his master's and his PhD at Utrecht University. And he was doing simulation work on the horse and horse hind limb and also instrumented uh, horse hind limbs with force, muscle force transducers and EMG electrodes and length transducers. And I was trying to do a very similar thing on the cat hind limb in Calgary at the very same time. And so we got to know each other really early on in life, in our scientific life. Ton then, of course, also spent uh, five years at the University of Calgary from 1993 to 1998. And what I really remember about that time is that aside from the fabulous outstanding research he did, I admired his teaching ability. He was a fabulous undergraduate teacher in the classes. And more than that, he was an incredibly patient and careful and very diligent mentor to graduate students and trainees. And I think that's what really impressed me uh, when he was in Calgary. And he was, uh, it was really a big loss for the University of Calgary when he left then first to uh, uh, to, to Cleveland and then uh, to the uh, Cleveland Clinic and then to Cleveland State University. Uh, Tom has also made a name outside of uh, academia. As you may know, his animations and simulations were used in several major films and for that he received the technical Oscar and you see him right here next to Oscar and the whole uh, thing here was hosted by no other than Scarlett Johansson. So, uh, big event and congratulations uh, to that. The other uh, invited speakers for the symposium after Tom gives his major talk uh, will be supplemented by Colin Smith, Michael Haley and Anne Colliwine. Um, and uh, now it's uh, time for me to step aside, uh, introduce Tom van den Bochert. He will be talking about probabilistic simulation of ACL injury risk in sport and we'll also put that into the context of the importance of modeling human control noise when predicting optimal movement trajectories. And with this, I would like to ask Ton, so to speak, to come to the podium, 
Uh, you can cheer at home, please do so. And let's welcome Don van den Bogert. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, that's absolutely a great honor to receive this award. It's something I, I never expected. And it's really great to see 128 people in the room right now. Um, that encourages me uh, to think that the topic uh, is of interest. I will start sharing my screen right now. Oh, the host has disabled the screen sharing. Can so someone... can the host, uh, please, uh, the technical helper, can you please uh, allow Ton van den Bogen to share the screen? Yeah, you should. I just made your yeah. comments there, so you should be able to share the screen now. It still says host disabled participant screen sharing. You need to make me a co-host. You are. Now it works. Okay, great. Share my screen. So as Walter mentioned, um, the topic of my talk and the topic of the whole session is probabilistic simulation biomechanics. And I picked that because I feel it is one of the most important concepts that has recently been uh, presented in biomechanics and especially in simulation and more specifically sports biomechanics. I'd like to start with Jim Hay. I did not know Jim Hay personally, but here we are coincidentally together at a picture that was taken at Dodger Stadium in 1989 during the ISB meeting uh, in the days when we still had real conferences and we could still go to baseball games. So Jim Hay is there in the green shirt. I'm right behind him. Next to Jim Hay is Barry Wilson, his former student. And then interestingly on the foreground, we have two former winners of the Jim Hay Award, Mont Hubbard and Peter Kavanaugh. Now, Jim Hay uh, was famous for what he called deterministic models of motor skills. And uh, they also became known as Hayograms. And here's one in Jim Hay's own handwriting about softball pitch. So what Jim Hay would do is he would start with the goal that you're trying to achieve in a sports activity. Uh, and he would break it down into all the factors that contribute to that. So in the, in the baseball pitch, the advantage you're trying to achieve is a good strike, and that obviously depends on the trajectory of the ball. And the trajectory of the ball then depends on how the ball is released and on some aerodynamics. And then ultimately, at the very bottom, uh, the forces in the arms and the legs and the trunk. So you could use these diagrams to design experiments, um, but you could also read them from the bottom to the top as a flow chart of a computer simulation. Um, although Jim Hay uh, used the word deterministic here, um, real athletes and, and real sports activities are not deterministic. They're always random factors that you cannot control. There could be gusts of wind that influence the flight of the ball. And then you have um, your, uh, your motor control uh, system is not perfectly uh, reproducible. So there's always some things you can't control. And that's why in uh, human subject experiments or in Im improvement of sports performance, uh, when we do experiments, uh, we, we deal with deterministic inputs that we can control and then there are random inputs that we can't control. And that's why we have to do multiple subjects, multiple trials and statistical analysis to, to make sure that our conclusions are valid. Then when we go to computer models, uh, we make it uh, deterministic. Um, and then if you run the model multiple times, you always get the same answer. And it's very, very nice because then you can systematically explore the effect of all the inputs and you always get the same answer and there's no confusion about the conclusions. Uh, now, when you go to uh, probabilistic uh, or stochastic computer models, you bring that randomness back in as random inputs that are basically random numbers and your output then uh, is no longer perfectly predictable. 
Now, why on earth would you want to do that to make things uh, more complicated and, and less predictable? That's what this session is about. And, and I hope that at the end of the session, you'll have a good appreciation for why we're starting to do these things. So to complete uh, the session, I've invited three speakers who have been doing excellent work in this general area. Uh, Colin Smith will talk about probabilistic simulation of knee surgeries. And Mike uh, Hiley from Loughborough University. We'll talk about uh, gymnastics. She will talk about some more fundamental things uh, about antagonistic co-contraction being predicted with uh, probabilistic simulation. The first uh, hint that something like this was important uh, was when I was still at the University of Calgary in the late 1990s with Ian Wright's uh, PhD work on impact forces in running. We were interested in the effect of shoe hardness on impact forces that had been studied quite a bit in uh, uh, experimentally with force plates. And they always found that the hardness of the shoe didn't really affect the impact force. The explanation was always that the runners must be doing some adaptation. Um, so they would adapt their movement to get always the same impact force, no matter what the shoe was. And to investigate that, we thought it would be a good idea to have a computer model where we could control all these things and figure out how these uh, affect the impact force. So Ian made models of nine runners, uh, ran uh, forward dynamic simulations with the different shoe conditions. And to our great surprise, in, of those nine models, in nine of them, uh, in seven of the nine, the hard shoe created a larger impact force, but in two of the nine, the impact force actually went down with the harder shoe. That was kind of puzzling, uh, but then when we started looking in more detail at these simulations, we found out that the harder shoe also caused the knee flexion to occur more quickly. And we think that that compensates somewhat for the uh, increase of the impact force because when your knee is more flexed, you're absorbing the impact force better. And so we have two effects that go in opposite direction. The direct effect of the shoe increases the force and then the knee flexion decreases it. And um, we call that a passive regulation of impact force. Now imagine if we had done this experiment in only one model, uh, we could have gotten the increase or the decrease and we would have really not understood anything about this mechanism. Uh, so that was a nice explanation for that experimental result actually. Um, so what we learned from this is variations of the same model can actually can produce very different results. And I trust simulation studies uh, when they include those variations and do statistical analysis just like you would do in human subjects. And in some problems like the one that I just showed that is actually essential. A few years later, I wanted to use a similar model to study ACL injuries. And it was really about uh, using models to, um, to look at prevention strategies. So my first hypothesis, and that's kind of a, the, the, the basic test that I figured was necessary, that the models should be able to explain why females have a higher risk of injury. That would tell me that some, some of the mechanism was correctly represented. And uh, the, the graph at the bottom is actually how I presented uh, that hypothesis in my grant proposal. Imagine if you could measure the force in ACL continuously all the time, uh, you would end up with a probability distribution. And in this example, this is made up, uh, females would actually have on average lower ACL forces. But then if you look in the tail end of the distribution, when you get above the injury threshold, the area under the curve is actually larger for females, so they would get um, more injuries. So that was what I hypothesized as a possible explanation. Now to get all these to get this whole probability density, you, you need to run lots of simulations that cover that whole range. So let's uh, assume we could do that. Then when we have a model that can generate these injuries, we can use it to investigate prevention, uh, things like neuromuscular training and, and footwear. So this was uh, Scott McLean's work at the clinic. Uh, 
Um, he recruited uh, basketball players, uh, males and females. We made musculoskeletal models of them. Motion capture, ground reaction force, they all performed three sports maneuvers and three trials of each. Then we created muscle excitation patterns that produce simulations to fit the mean of these trials that they performed in the lab. That's a simulation of their normal movements. Then you need to generate these injuries, and this is what we did. Uh, we randomly altered the initial conditions, which means the position and velocity of the body segments at heel strike. And we could do that because we had 10 trials from each athlete in each activity. And so we knew what their standard deviation was. Then assuming a Gaussian distribution, you can generate as many samples of that uh, as you want. So we could generate 5,000 more initial conditions uh, to run these simulations. And then, uh, so that's 20 uh, models times 5,000. That's 100,000 simulations, which at that time we could do fairly quickly. Um, then from each simulation, the knee joint loading variables were extracted, specifically the anterior drawer force and the valgus moment and we made histograms. First thing that was interesting is that the anterior drawer forces in all those 100,000 simulations never went above 900 Newtons. And it takes about 2000 to tear the ACL. Uh, so that definitely wouldn't uh, produce any injuries. But the valgus moment was more interesting. Uh, we used 125 Newton meters as an injury threshold and we got some injuries. And what was also nice to see was that the female models uh, got about twice as many injuries as the male models. So there we had our uh, injury model. And then we can experiment with prevention. Neuromuscular training, uh, you could think of reducing the movement variability, then you make that probability distribution narrower. I don't think that was realistic and it's almost too easy. Um, I don't think athletes could really reduce their variability even more than, than, it, than they did. Uh, they're skilled athletes. But what you could do is try to teach them a safer position of their body when they hit the ground. We looked at lots of variables, and here's just one example. If we um, say you have to uh, have an internal rotation velocity that's 100 degrees per second higher than what you did in the lab, run all those 5,000 simulations, you uh, get less injuries. And then you can look at one of those 5,000 where you had an injury and see how it was altered. So the red curve is the valgus moment that went above the injury threshold and with the altered, uh, uh, with the training that altered your movement, you, went, you were below the threshold. So those are some things that I don't think are final answers, but you can generate some ideas that you could then test in training studies. So for instance, that increased hip internal rotation velocity basically uh, tells you, uh, you tell them, turn your foot in the direction where you're going before you hit the ground, that sort of thing. Uh, we looked at the shoe because that would be an interesting way to make the movement safer and reducing the friction coefficient was an obvious uh, idea. Would that prevent the high valgus moments? Yes, it did. You run all those simulations and you get fewer injuries. But uh, there was something going on that we didn't like because a lot of those simulations now no longer perform the change of direction. Uh, there was a lot of slipping going on. Um, the uh, friction was no longer sufficient. Now, if you give a, a lower friction shoe to an athlete, they would probably still be able to function with it. They would adapt their movement, maybe have a higher vertical force uh, uh, during the stance phase by pushing off more actively and that sort of thing. But we had no way of predicting those ap uh, adaptations. So we couldn't really do much with this idea. What I learned from that was that uh, you always have to consider the performance of the task. And what we need to work towards is what I call task constrained predictive simulation. So all your simulations, they must perform exactly a specified task. So that could be a change of direction um, without losing speed and do it in a certain time. 
then there's still an infinite number of ways to perform that task. And then you could look for uh, the solution that gives you the minimal energy cost and a minimal injury risk and that sort of thing. But that constraint must be there. Otherwise, your uh, uh, simulation study is going to tell you, you can reduce the energy cost, you can reduce the injuries by not exactly performing the task. That's not a useful answer and it's definitely not an answer that an athlete would like to hear. So we started doing uh, predictive simulation of walking. Uh, people have been trying to do that, but uh, Marco Ackermann uh, developed a, a new method to solve these problems quite quickly. So it's a musculoskeletal model. The task constraints are you have to walk at a certain speed and it has to be periodic, that's all. Then there's still an infinite number of ways to do that. Then you try to find the one that minimizes the muscle activation and there's specific cost functions that were tried um, and they all depend on muscle activation, obviously integrated over time. They differ in the exponent P and then they also differ in whether or not the muscle volume is multiplied by the activation cost. So that activation of a larger muscle would cost more an activation of a small muscle, and we call those energy-like because the size is involved. And I did other variations since then as well. Now, the results, they predicted some features of walking. Um, and the animation is not playing for some reason, but that's okay. Um, if you look at these simulated walks, they don't quite look realistic. Uh, they look a little bit passive. Uh, there's not really much of an active push off. The stance leg collapses too early. The leg is basically thrown uh, forward. Um, and especially the muscle forces are extremely low. You see those on the right hand side. If you've ever seen muscle forces estimated from uh, uh, real gait data, uh, they're usually in the thousands and these are in the hundreds. Uh, unrealistically low muscle forces. So that was kind of disappointing. And I haven't really, uh, I, uh, occasionally I revisit this and, and, and try to use other variations of the cost function and um, it never really uh, uh, got much better. We have been able to do some useful work with this by adding a term to the cost function that encourages it to walk normally. So we've been able to do studies on amputees and running shoes and, and things like that with this approach, but not by just minimizing muscle activation because then you always get these unrealistic motions. Um, now, it's really good to, to, to kind of re, uh, look at this failure because uh, I always say when in research, when something fails, that's when you have to pay it. So why does this model not walk more realistically? Well, it's a simple model, two-dimensional. Uh, the muscle models are hill-based. They don't have a lot of the features that we know that muscles have. The cost function may not be the right one. You could think of all of those things. Um, but what remains is that this optimization found a way to walk with extremely low muscle forces. And that result only depends on multi-body dynamics, which is Newton's laws. And that is not debatable, really. So I'd like to turn this question around. If it is possible to walk like this, why do people not do it? And I gradually kind of came to this idea that, well, they could do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's possible, but maybe it's too hard to control because the timing of the collapse of the stance leg is too critical. Maybe it's too risky. Uh, your, your swing uh, foot hits the ground. And this idea was, was also inspired by Mike Hiley's work on, on gymnastics, where he also talks about these things. So how do you put that sort of idea into a predictive simulation? Uh, a good example of, of that sort of idea uh, comes from the reinforcement learning world. It's this machine learning. And this is a picture from, the, from a famous textbook where they present the cliff walking task. Uh, 
So if you want to go from start S to goal G, um, you would take the shortest path, which is labeled here as the optimal path. Now, if occasionally you make a mistake because you're not perfect, you're going to fall down the cliff and spend a lot of effort climbing back up to get back to your optimal path. Um, so what you would probably want to do to minimize the, the effort is to take that safe path, to stay away from that cliff a little bit. Um, so a deterministic model would predict that optimal path, but a, a more realistic model that takes into account that you make mistakes presents a more realistic, uh, predicts a more realistic safe path. So well, then you get into stochastic optimal control. And optimal control always talks about state variables x, control variables u, and system dynamics is a differential equation. And in stochastic systems, there is a random term added to it. So there is some unpredictability in the system. And the cost function is, is the same. It's a time integral of something. Now, in control theory, there is something called the certainty equivalence theorem that says if your uh, differential equation is linear and the cost function is quadratic, the optimal trajectory does not depend on that uncertainty. Now, in the cliff walking task, the cost function is not quadratic because on the right side of the optimal path, it goes up a lot faster than on on the left side of the optimal path. So that's, where, that's why uh, we have to take into account that uncertainty in the system. Uh, now in engineering, they usually assume this equivalence anyway, even though they know it's not always valid. So in, in uh, robot trajectories, they just design uh, the tra trajectory based on everything being perfect and then they put a feedback controller on there to basically enforce the uh, system to, to follow that trajectory. But that's not what humans do, I think. I think humans are more clever than that. So Anna did this as part of her PhD, uh, starting with the very simplest uh, task in a nonlinear system, and it's a pendulum. So pendulum dynamics is very well known, of course. And it's nonlinear because the gravity term is angle dependent with a cosine here. And then there's this control torque, and then there's the randomness. And the task is to swing this pendulum from the bottom position to the top position in a given amount of time with minimal square torque. And Anna came up with a, a, a new method for solving this, um, and it's actually not, not easy to formulate that correctly, um, but she managed to do that. And this was recently published in Journal of Biomechanics. So let's look at some of the solutions that came out of that uh, prediction. Let's first look at the deterministic one that comes from the, uh, uh, the one where you have no uncertainty in the system. Deterministic pendulum with the blue uh, arrows here. Let's first look at the torque. The optimal strategy is to have positive, negative, positive, negative, alternating torque to swing this pendulum higher and higher. And then at about eight seconds, you basically turn off the torque and there's just enough kinetic energy to reach the top. Gravity will slow it down and you stop perfectly at the top position at zero velocity. That's the deterministic optimal strategy. If there's uncertainty in the system, the uh, Optimization told us you have to do something different. You have to be much more active at the end. So there is a positive uh, torque here that actively moves you towards the top and then a negative torque that slows you down actively. So you're not really relying on passive dynamics uh, so much there. And also the, the, that final swing up occurs much later. Now, it looks like that active solution would cost you more, right? It's more effort, more torque. Uh, but actually, if you take into account the uncertainty, it costs you less. And that's because that deterministic trajectory spends about two seconds in the um, inverted unstable position where you require quite strong feedback control to make sure you reach that top position. And that cost is taken into account. So 
the solution that looks like it is more effort actually is less effort. And that's the one that takes into account the uncertainty. And then it's fairly straightforward to just add more links and more torques. And then you can have a torque controlled gate model and you can tell it, try to walk normally uh, with minimal torque. What came out of that was that the, uh, the toe clearance during the swing phase was zero when you don't take the uncertainty into account. And that makes sense because um, that's the one where you spend the least effort. But if you take uncertainty into account, uh, you will occasionally make a mistake in your motor control and your foot will hit the ground. Now suddenly you have to spend a lot of effort to lift the foot off the ground or to swing it through in spite of the friction. And um, so that's not an optimal trajectory. And we were thinking maybe we can predict that with, the, with that new method of doing the stochastic optimal control. And that worked really nicely. Um, if you tell the optimization that there's more and more uncertainty, you get more and more foot clearance. And it takes that into account when it's planning that optimal trajectory. We haven't uh, really been able to scale this up to muscle models or, or three dimensions, but we feel like the concept is, is very promising. So in summary, I would like to say that uh, probabilistic biomechanical models are needed to do simulation studies to quantify risk of injury. And then we also found it necessary to use probabilistic models to predict realistic human behavior uh, from simple cost functions. And that can be done by taking that uncertainty into account. So I'd like to acknowledge the funding sources and I've always been very lucky to have smart people working for me. Otherwise, this work could never have been done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ton, for, for a fabulous talk. We have, uh, we have several questions, and I'm going, to, um, I'm going to read a couple of those to you. Um, the first one, actually, you, you answered already a bit because Ross Wilkinson was asking uh, in the middle of your talk, about uh, certain ground clearance that might be needed and will cost more energy in your model. And so I guess you answered that with, with, the, with, with your last thing there. But then uh, Jill McNick Gray asks, um, how do you go about weighting the margin of error or the uncertainty in your model um, to uh, avoid injury or to optimize performance? How, how do you make those decisions on the uncertainty? So the, the beauty of this is that you don't need to alter the cost function at all. You don't have to uh, add a cost for the risk um, or, or the failure. Uh, you just use the same cost function for, for, for every problem. It's minimal effort. But then where you put the uncertainty in is in the, in the model of the system itself. So that the system is not deterministic. Um, so you apply some control, um, but not always the same um, accelerations come out. And that then drives the system to more um, safer strategies. So the cost function is still very simple and you don't have to have a cost function with, with two parts in it. That's, that's the beauty of this. I hope that answers the question. Good. Um, uh, another question from uh, James Findlay, and I'm reading it directly. Does the qualitative nature of solutions to stochastic optimal control problems depend on whether one simulates uncertainty in state estimates versus the noise in the control signal? Um, it, it can depend. So what we did here was we simply added a random term to the differential equation. Um, that kind of represents you have a random uh, external torque being applied on top of your controls that you uh, have control over. Um, but you could also put uncertainty in the, in the sensory feedback. Uh, it would be similar, um, I think. Uh, it would be qualitatively similar, um, but we haven't done much with that. Yeah. And, and the last question, um, why 
did it turn out that the women in the ACL injury risk model uh, were more vulnerable? Were there kinematics uh, differences between the men and women or what made them more vulnerable at the high end of ACL loading? There were some things that were already known before we did these simulations that uh, about how women and men perform these maneuvers. So women, uh, there have been studies that show women have more variability. Now, of course, that depends on skill level. So I'm not sure um, if you can generalize that. But the other thing that's known about women is that they already have higher valgus loads um, in their normal execution of the movement. And I think that makes them more vulnerable to get even higher and get injured. Fabulous. Uh, thank you very much, Ton. And I think you'll be introducing the next speaker. Is that correct? I will introduce the next speaker. Um, so we've got to make sure that he can share his screen. So the next speaker is, is Colin Smith from uh, ETH in Zurich. And uh, Colin did his PhD at University of Wisconsin Madison with uh, Daryl Thielen. And uh, a couple of years ago, I saw his work on probabilistic simulation, which is which is very impressive. And I, uh, uh, when I had a chance to organize this session, he was one of the first people that came to mind. So I'm very happy that Colin is here. So Colin, go ahead. All right. Thank you very much for the the kind introduction. Just to double check, my my slides are showing. Yes. Yes, okay. yes, they are, and we hear you well. So, first of all, thanks to ASB for moving this virtual. It certainly made my travel a little easier from Zurich. Um, but like Tan said, I'm, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about how to use probabilistic simulation in personalizing knee surgeries. Uh, so to start with, how does this fit into a, a sports biomechanics session? Well, Tan actually nicely just introduced that, but lots of athletes go, undergo ACL injuries. And as a result, they get ACL reconstructions. And despite the short term being quite optimistic for those outcomes, the long term is bad with high rates of early onset osteoarthritis after ACL reconstruction. And so we end up seeing higher rates of OA in athletes and also higher rates of total joint replacement. And at the end of that, you can end up with quite dissatisfied athletes who can't use the joint replacement the way they'd like to. So in this talk, I really like to focus on how to improve the ACL reconstruction surgery to reduce the rates of osteoarthritis, and then how to improve total knee replacement to reduce patient dissatisfaction. I think if you're looking for simulations about ACL injury, then I think Tan's Google Scholar is probably the right place to start, and he just gave you a, a nice overview. So I won't go into any of the injury mechanisms. So I think what, what Tan was actually talking about was a, a webinar, an open sim webinar that Daryl and I put on, um, trying to show how you can use high throughput computing to do probabilistic simulation. And so when you start to kind of do probabilistic simulations, the first issue that you run into is computing power. So for us, we were trying to run simulations that took about a half hour on a normal desktop computer. And this is where high throughput computing comes in. And so essentially this is a huge computing cluster of a bunch of universities across the US that are all connected. And so you can launch simulations onto computers that are not being used at the universities. Uh, and the fancy thing about this, or actually not fancy thing about this, is that none of these computers can talk to each other. So it's not necessarily supercomputing. Most of the time these are just empty computers in uh, university computer rooms. But as a result, we were now able to run 5,000 simulations in about two hours. And so what that enables us to do is start doing these Monte Carlo style studies where we vary parameters in the models. And then we look at how uncertainty in the inputs propagates to the predictions. And then we can even take it a step further and look at how sensitive, to, how sensitive our predictions are to the uncertain input parameters. And so this has really kind of become the framework that we've used for simulation studies since we got this working. So the next thing that I've been working on is developing multi-body simulation techniques to have six degree of freedom joints. So this is, let's see if you can 
just gonna turn on my laser pointer. Here is a beta release of a, a project I've been working on, but essentially what it is is a plugin for OpenSim and allows you to include ligaments in the model and then also articular contacts using an elastic foundation model. And so what this means is that now you can have six degree freedom joints in your model. So you don't have to have these simplified kinematic constraints like a hinge knee joint. And the toolkit also allows you to analyze measured kinematics. So we can just drive the models using measurements from fluoroscopy, like you're seeing here, and then map the distances between the subchondral bone or look at the elongation pattern of the ligaments. And so once you start having these full six degree freedom models or joint models in your musculoskeletal models, you actually need to come up with a new simulation framework. And so we've developed COMAC. Um, what this does is it allows you to start with motion analysis data, so that's ground reaction forces, and then the primary kinematics, uh, which you get from motion capture. So for us, this is the six pelvis degrees of freedom, three hip degrees of freedom, only tibiofemoral flexion and ankle flexion. Um, so we're not measuring any of the, the secondary kinematics of the knee. We input these into uh, an optimization problem. And so I won't go into the details here, but essentially you're trying to come up with the muscle forces you need to generate that measured external motion. And at the same time, you're solving for the equilibrium joint mechanics. So what comes out of it is you get muscle forces for motion that you've measured, but you also get these secondary kinematics. So it's all of the degrees of freedom in the knee that you didn't measure with motion capture. You also end up predicting ligament forces and in the end, you get the articular contact pressures. So this is now looking at a uh, simulation of walking for a healthy young adult subject. And so now this is all available to download in a beta release uh, so you can try it out yourself. And so once we built this, we started thinking about how can we use it to personalize surgeries. So I think kind of a standard framework that most people would come up with is you start with measurements, some sort of imaging, gait analysis, you would build a patient-specific model. You'd do some sort of virtual surgical simulations on this model, and then you would hand over to the surgeon and they would do it. This is obviously a super difficult thing to do, and there's all sorts of, of issues and obstacles to getting there. So at the moment, we're not doing full-blown patient-specific uh, predictions and surgeries, what I'd like to use this presentation to do is really talk about how we can use probabilistic simulation to inform personalized treatments here for ACL reconstruction and total knee replacement. So first we'll jump into the ACL reconstruction. Here the surgeon has three parameters they get to control. First is the tunnel placement, so where they put the tibial and the femoral tunnels. Second is the pretension that they put on the graft. And then third is the graft type, and through that they get to determine the stiffness. Uh, depending on the material that they use and how many times they fold it over. And so if you're trying to improve the ACL reconstruction surgery to mitigate this early OA problem, Scott Tashman has shown with biplane fluoroscopy measurements that ACL reconstructed individuals have altered knee kinematics. And so this propagates to altered cartilage loading patterns. And this is what's thought to be one of the causes of the early onset osteoarthritis. And so now the surgical community has moved to this approach called anatomic ACL reconstruction. So now they're trying really hard to, to put the tunnels through the anatomic ACL footprints and also try and match the graft to the native properties of the ACL. Unfortunately, this isn't that easy of a thing to do. So if you're looking at the femoral ACL footprint through an arthroscope, it's not so clear exactly where the ACL footprint is. And then depending on the instrumentation you're using, Hitting that footprint is not so easy. Additionally, there's quite a lot of uncertainty that you don't get to control precisely with current surgical techniques in the graft pretension and the stiffness. And so what we did is we started with experiments. We looked at 18 patients that had ACL reconstructions, and we started with static MRIs and just compared their healthy and their ACL reconstruction, looking at the angles of the graft, uh, and then also the locations on the, the bones. Then we did dynamic MRI. So we had these patients lie in an MRI board and flex and extend against a load. And so we used this dynamic MRI to measure their tibiofemoral knee kinematics. And so in the end, what we found was that the ACL sagittal plane geometry was the most important geometric method. 
And so I'll try and walk you through a case study here that will explain what we found. So in one patient, you had an ACL graft that was more vertical than their healthy native geometry. And this led to increased anterior tibial translation. And this uh, we also saw across the entire population of our study. The vertical graft also then led to increased internal tibial rotation. And we saw this same relationship in all of the other patients in our study. But the problem that we run into here is that we have a small patient population and we don't know if this correlation is actually causal. And so that's where we started trying to use these probabilistic simulations. So we took uh, just a model of a young healthy subject and we varied the ACL attachments uh, to the bones and then also the stiffness and the pretension. We used our high throughput computing grid to run thousands of simulations replicating the dynamic MRI. And then we were able to come up with these same scatter plots. And so first, if we look at the anterior translation, we can see that we have a similar trend in our, both our experiments here and in our simulations. Additionally, we see the same trend uh, between the, sim the experiments and simulations in internal rotation. And so what we were able to do is virtually expand our patient population by using probabilistic simulations. Now that we're using a physics-based model, we can actually say that there is causality between the sagittal plane graft angle and the change in the kinematics in this dynamic MRI task. Uh, and even though we didn't actually build patient-specific models, we ended up being able to tell our surgeons that if you personalize this sagittal plane angle, this is the most important geometric metric that you have to get right, regardless of what you do with the pretension and the stiff. So now I'd like to quickly jump to total knee replacement. And here the surgeon has, again, kind of three things they get to control. One is the implant design. So there's lots of designs out there from different manufacturers. Two is the implant alignment. And so now with patient-specific instrumentation and the surgical robots that are coming out, we can actually control this quite precisely. And the last is ligament release. And this is quite a lot harder to control. So there's a lot of uncertainty in, in how the surgeon actually releases the ligaments. And so there's not so much of a, a clear surgical consensus, but one approach that surgeons are using now is called kinematic alignment. And the goal here is to restore the ligament elongations and the articular geometries of what the knee was when it was healthy. So in our lab here at ETH Zurich, we've developed this moving fluoroscope. And so what it can do is track a patient's knee as they're performing a locomotor motion. And so that gives you these complete videos of gait cycles of a patient's knee. What we can then do is use a 2D to 3D uh, image registration to match their 3D component geometries to the 2D images. And we get implant kinematics out of that. We can then use those implant kinematics to drive multi-body knee models where we include the ligaments. And this now allows us to examine the ligament elongations both before and after a total knee replacement. And so here again, we wanted to try and use probabilistic modeling. So we took one of these measurements uh, and what we did, again, just vary the attachment location of these ligaments that we include in this model. So it's not really a simulation anymore because we're just driving the model with measured kinematics, but we're changing where the ligaments are attached. And so again, we do this Monte Carlo analysis where we randomly sample ligament attachments. And the first thing that we can do is look at the uncertainty propagation. So obviously when you're picking these ligament attachments, it's not so clear even if you have an MRI. Uh, so this can help you quantify how far off you might be. But then even probably more importantly, we can look at the sensitivities. And so here on the x-axis, you can see the, an anterior perturbation to the attachment point or a superior perturbation to the attachment point. And the big takeaway here is that the max strain in the MCL and LCL ligaments were much more sensitive to the femoral attachments than the tibial attachments. So if we go back and think about this, if we simplify the kind of model of knee kinematics and just talk about the tibia flexing extending about an axis fixed in the femur. Then if we look at where the MCL attachment is relative to that fixed flexion axis, this actually is what 
kind of dominates the MCL elongations. And so at the end of the day, the placement of this femoral component is what really is going to be the important piece in getting the elongations to match or restore to help the elongation patterns after the surgery. So with that, I'd just like to finish up by kind of revisiting this personalized uh, modeling vision. So of course, we kind of all want to go here where the model predicts this optimal surgical plan. But at the moment, there's just so much uncertainty and so difficult to get all of the measurements that you need that this is probably not a realistic approach. And so I think what probabilistic modeling allows you to do is two major things here in, in trying to personalize surgeries. First, you can map all of the plausible surgeries and their outcomes. So if it's something like component alignment where you can control it with a robot, uh, now you can start looking at all of your possibilities that you could do rather than just giving the surgeon one uh, ideal one. And then two, you can start accommodating for uncertainty in less precise surgical techniques. So in ligament release, where it's not so easy to do something precise, we can bring that into the model. So with that, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators and funding sources for this and remind you that there is a beta version available of OpenSimJam for you to use. And also all of the experimental data here uh, from the fluoroscopy is available through the Cantony data set. So with that, uh, say thank you and happy to answer any questions. Fabulous, thank you very much for, the, for a very nice talk, Colin. We have several questions here and I'm gonna choose some. Well, the first one goes right along what you're mentioning. Uh, Jasmine Cruz asks, does your OpenSIM project contain tutorials on how to use the plugin you developed? Do you have to? Yeah, so there, there's like five different examples. One of them will show you how to just input kinematics and drive your, your models. Uh, and then it shows you how to do a passive flexion example and then the full blown walking example. So there are examples there. I'm still uh, getting it all organized. So it's a beta release, but certainly is, is there for you to try. Good. And Karen Troy is asking, uh, how much variability is there in the intact ACL sagittal plane angle? Are individuals with a higher angle also more likely to sustain an ACL injury? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, I don't know exactly. I know that we have looked at the variability in the, the healthy population, but I, I can't tell you what it is off the top of my head. I want to say it's around 10 to 15 degrees, but you should double check that. What I can tell you is that we've done these simulations where we, we vary the, the attachment. And if we get super vertical, you end up driving the ACL graft forces way up. Um, so I would assume that a vertical graft, or sorry, even a vertical native ACL would probably make you more susceptible for injury. Yep. And a quick last question from uh, Nathan Shiladi. He says, you demonstrated the effect of the increased sagittal graft angle on anterior tibial translation and internal knee rotation. With your simulations, have you looked at the effect in the frontal plane, i.e. knee abduction and adduction? Um, so we, we ended up on the sagittal plane angle because that's what showed up in the experimental correlations. Um, if you look at this paper that's just about to come out in AJSM, we actually do look at the coronal plane angle there as well. And we actually extend it to walking. So then we do walking simulations and we see that these correlations actually show up in the, in the walking task as well. Fabulous. Thank you, Colin. Maybe, Ton, I can ask you to introduce uh, the next speaker. Yes, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. The next speaker is Michael Hiley from Loughborough University in the UK. And uh, I already mentioned in my talk that I, I give um, Mike Hiley a, a lot of credit for making me aware of the importance of uncertainty in, uh, in human motion and how it can affect optimal strategies. I had heard um, Fred Eden talk about that maybe 20 years ago and I always thought, well, sure, yeah, then you get some variability, but what's the big deal? But um, Mike really showed that you uh, get different optimal strategies if you take the uncertainty into account. And he's continued doing work on various uh, gymnastics uh, tasks. So I'm really happy that uh, Mike is here. Uh, so Mike, please share your screen and uh, go ahead. Can you see my screen? No, 
No. Not yet. Uh, I press the share button. Hang on. Uh, Seems to be coming. Yes. How about that? Yes, fabulous. Got my slides on my uh, presenter. Okay. First of all, uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you uh, for inviting me to talk in your session. And secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of my co-author, Professor Fred Yeadon. Uh, the presentation will be in two parts. The first part, I'll give an introduction as to how we started using movement variability in our optimizations, followed by the study on how or on control with varying initial conditions. So it all started with the Kachev release and grasp on high bar. Uh, the gymnast rotates in the opposite direction in flight to the preceding swing. And the reason we got interested in variability or movement variability was the solutions to some of our computer simulation optimizations just weren't quite satisfactory. Now, in gymnastics, consistency of performance is very important. Our subject was very consistent, unfortunately, not at catching the bar. Initially, we were interested in capturing 10 successful performances, but it took us 60 trials over a number of sessions to capture these. We were interested in the release window, which is the period of time when the gymnast has sufficient linear and angular momentum to release the bar and then successfully catch it. For the 10 court trials, the gymnast had a release window of around about 29 or an average release window of 29 milliseconds and a minimum release window of 10 milliseconds. Now existing literature suggested that an unsuccessful catcher could have been caught if the gymnast released either slightly earlier or slightly later. But for our uh, participant or gymnast, this wasn't the case as some of his trials had no release window at all. Therefore, a change in technique was needed and at the time we thought the obvious thing to do would be to maximize the release window. We used a simulation model, a four segment angle driven simulation model to optimize the technique in the Kachev. After optimization, a suitably large release window was obtained. However, the technique didn't look like what you'd expect a gymnast to do. When we look at the joint angle time histories of the 20 best trials, so those are the 10 that the gymnast caught and the 10 that the gymnast almost caught, we can see that the gymnast is pretty consistent in what he's trying to do, but there's still some variation in his motor output. And this was quantified by the turning points between flexion extension at the hip and shoulder. Here we've got an example of the deviations in the timings for one of those turning points. And for this data, it happens to be normally distributed. But if we look at the deviations over all of the hip and shoulder turning points, we have a, an average standard deviation of around about, whoops, sorry, 10 milliseconds. And for the angles, we have around about three degrees. So when we take the optimum technique for maximizing the release window and randomly perturb it to the level of uh, the noise, if you like, in the recorded performances, okay, we find that that optimum performance becomes only as successful as the recorded performances. Therefore, a different optimization criterion would be necessary to obtain a consistently successful solution. So we chose to maximize success. As in the previous optimization, the parameters defining the joint angle time histories were allowed to vary. Then for each set of parameters determined by the optimization algorithm, 500 randomly perturbed simulations were performed. 
In other words, a little bit of noise is added to the time and the angle parameters, so the model doesn't produce the planned movements exactly. If a simulation resulted in a suitably large release window and did not exceed the strength limits of the gymnast, it was deemed to be successful. So the optimization was looking for a technique that produced the most number of successful simulations out of 500, despite being randomly perturbed. As you can see, this involved quite a few simulations. When the solution for maximizing success is perturbed, it remains successful 90% of the time and produced a technique that looked much closer to what you would expect a gymnast to use. So in conclusion, or it is concluded that gymnast technique is characterized by maximizing success, where maximizing success is about satisfying the various constraints on the system which include motor system noise. And that gymnasts develop techniques that are able to cope with the level of execution error in their movements. And similar results have been found for other gymnastic swinging, swinging skills. And we find that solutions from other optimization criteria, whether they be minimizing some physiological aspects, such as minimizing joint torques, or maximizing some biomechanical measure, they're rarely robust to the level of variation in human movement. So back to the present study, it's on the control of a whole body task with uncertain initial conditions. This time it's the upstart, which is a fundamental skill in gymnastics, which is used by gymnasts of all abilities. It's used to transport the gymnast from a swing below the bar to a position of support above the bar. At the Rio Olympics, 365 upstarts were performed by 110 gymnasts in competition one, which is the qualifying competition, all of which was successful. Now this skill is often used to link between skills, normally after a releasing recatch and for women's artistic gymnastics when they transition between the two bars, which can lead to variable initial conditions. Previous simulation work on the upstart has started from fixed initial conditions, that of initial orientation and angular velocity. And then due to the nature of modeling, this represents an open loop approach. However, the gymnast will often have variable initial conditions because of the reasons just outlined. Therefore, the aim of the study was to determine to what extent a feed forward schema for determining movement pattern parameters based on the initial angular velocity is more successful than operating an open loop strategy. Again, a simulation approach was used, and again, a four segment simulation model, which was angle driven, was used. We maximized success where perturbations were added to 14 parameters, which defined the joint angle time histories using a random number generator. Success for a simulation was defined as being able to achieve the final orientation above the bar without exceeding the joint torque limits. The time histories of the hip and shoulder can be defined by the turning points between flexion and extension. And for the upstart, we have four of these at the hip and three of these at the shoulder, each of which can be manipulated in the angle and time dimensions, giving us the 14 parameters. In this graph, zero refers to the point before which no change in joint angle is allowed, which is used to represent the time taken for the gymnast to evaluate their, the velocity of the swing. The upstart was optimized for 13 initial angular velocities, ranging from zero to 120 in steps of 10 degrees per second. A further optimization was performed where the initial angular velocity was randomly assigned over that same range. The optimizations were performed for 
strength elite gymnast and then 75 percent of that maximum to represent a weaker gymnast. Two feed forward schema were proposed where schema refers to the relationship between the initial conditions and the 14 movement pattern parameters. In the first schema, the time parameters were scaled to overall duration, as in generalized motor programs. In the second schema, linear fits were applied to all of the parameters. For comparison, we have two open loop solutions, and they were open loop in the sense that the response was chosen irrespective of the initial angular velocity. The first solution is from the optimization uh, where the initial angular velocity was 60 degrees per second, because that was the middle of the range. And the second solution is the optimization with the initial angular velocity, ran, which was randomized during the optimization. The table shows the success, <laughs> the success rate when both open loop and both schema were subjected to a varying initial angular velocity. As expected, the open loop solutions do rather poorly, even the one that's been optimized to be robust to the initial angular velocity. In other words, gymnasts are unlikely to operate in a truly open loop manner for the upstart. Surprisingly, schema one does a only a little bit better than the open loop solutions. However, schema two does well for both the strength conditions. Given that overall scaling for time, schema one does poorly, the interpretation is that gymnasts probably make more than one evaluation of the angular velocity or the state of the system and therefore correction during the movement. If we look at an ensemble of the 13 optimal solutions, which have been time normalized, you can see there's a little more variability in the initial part of the movement. It may be that adjustments are made early on in order to put the gymnast in a good position for the kipping movement, which is the rapid extension of the hip that raises the center of mass to the bar. So this may be something that coaches want to focus on. And to conclude, including motor system noise in optimization for us has led to more realistic solutions. And for the upstart, gymnasts most likely operate in a feed forward manner in order to cope with variable initial conditions. But also that they probably evaluate the state of their performance at more than one point during the swing. Although these results are for the upstart, it's possible that these, or likely that these may hold gen more generally for movements that allow time for such evaluations to be made. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mike, for a great talk. Beautiful, I've seen some of this before. Um, we, we have a, a question here from a, Alison Sheets Singer, and um, she says, do you have suggestions for deciding how much noise variability to add and to which signals do you add that variability? How do you make that decision? Okay, for, for the studies that we've done, we've taken the measures from multiple trials of recording the same movement. Um, there is an argument, and because it's angle driven, we're at adding it to, if you like, the motor output but we're trying if you like to represent the execution noise which would have some components of signal dependent signal independent and temporal noise so we're looking at what's coming out of the system but it's made up of lots of different things the uh, second question here is uh, uh, do you have a way for interpreting the effects of the noise or the variability in the parameters that's a tough question, isn't it? It is a tough question. We, the reason we've added it is because it helps us find these robust solutions, which humans find. So I, I haven't really got a definitive answer to, to that question. Yeah, very good question. And, uh, and the last question is, 
that you compared the upstart with the touch cap and, and I guess the one is a relatively simple movement and the other one is a relatively tough movement uh, to do. Are there different strategies in approaching a relatively simple gymnastics move with the noise consideration compared to one like the touch cap where you might actually completely lose, uh, uh, you know, uh, an optimal window for, for success? It's actually, the upstart is actually a difficult skill, especially for learners because the timing is very crucial. So this is why it's quite an interesting skill to look at. Some of the work we have also done is looked at the size of the solution space and the effect that the noise or execution error has on how adaptable your technique is and how successful you can be. So I, I consider the upstart to be one of those difficult, difficult skills. Um, Yes, there's probably more constraints on the Kachev, so maybe that has an effect on the solution space and constrains the successful technique for that skill. Okay. Great, thanks a lot. And then I was asked here to mention to everybody this uh, message from Lena Ting from the organizers. Uh, we have designated AMTI lounge location two for post-session discussions amongst the Jim Hay Award Symposium participants. So if you're interested in continuing the discussion after the, the, the session is officially over, you can go to AMT Lounge location two after the session. But before we do that, we have one more speaker and I ask Ton again uh, to introduce Anne Kollewein. Yes, so uh, last speaker in the session is Anne Kollewein. She, um, uh, did her PhD with me at Cleveland State University. She graduated in 2018 and spent uh, a year in Switzerland as a postdoc at EPFL and now is an assistant professor um, in the computer science department at Friedrich Alexander University in uh, Erlangen in Germany. Um, so I've already presented some of her work because it was too much uh, she did so much work and it wouldn't all fit in a 10 minute presentation. Uh, what she's going to present today is about antagonistic co-contraction. This is something uh, that was in her PhD thesis, but it took us about two years to put it in a form that we thought was convincing enough to be published. So we, we have submitted it for publication and um, it will be very interesting to see uh, what people think of this. So Anna, please go ahead. Please unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, that's not the right thing. All right, um, so do you see the presentation now? Yes. We see it and we hear you very well. Okay, great. Um, first of all, thanks, Don, for the introduction uh, and the uh, invitation to speak at the session. Um, so today I'm going to talk about co-contraction and how it can minimize effort in systems with uncertainty. So the motivation from this work um, comes from when we try to predict gait of persons with a transtibial amputation or a TTA gait. And so in experiments, what has been observed in TTA gait is that there is a lower knee flexion moment in stance. As you can see in the graph here on the right, which shows the knee moment as a function of the gait cycle, and at about 20% of the gait cycle, you can see that there is a peak in healthy, um, in healthy gait, which is shown in black, and a gray in the gray line, which uh, shows the TTA gait, there is, uh, this peak is missing. And another thing that was observed is also that there is increased energy expenditure. And these are at least partly due to co-contraction in the muscles of the upper leg on the prosthesis side. As you can see over here, we plot the EMG and intensity for the fastest lateralis and semimembranosis, also from an experiment, which are the muscles in the front and the back of the upper leg. And so what you can see is that the um, EMG intensity is higher, but also the muscles are active longer for the person with the amputation when compared to the normal person. However, uh, when we try to make 
predictive simulations of TTA gait using this approach that Tan already talked about, where we minimize muscular effort and add some tracking. We were not able to replicate this co-contraction. So here you see a graph of the muscle force as a function of the gait cycle. And as, even though there is some increased activation here in the hamstrings, um, we do not predict a similar increased and prolonged activity in both muscles. And also we found that metabolic cost was lower than normal. And so our question was, why is this co-contraction observed and not predicted? Um, and so we hypothesized because that this has uh, to do with the fact that there is uncertainty in the environment. And you've just seen in the talk by Michael Heidi that this is important um, in defining how a person moves. And there's also other work that shows this. So um, muscular co-contraction is the simultaneous activation of two muscles on both sides of a joint. And it's often described as inefficient um, because energy is expended without work actually being done. And so this contradicts the idea that uh, human movement is optimal with respect to energy. Instead, causes of co-contraction could be to increase the stiffness of the joint or the stability, um, to reduce stress in joint ligaments, to decrease the tibial shear force, among other uh, reasons. And also an important or uh, idea came from uh, Neville Hogan, who says that it might be necessary because of time delay in a neural system. So that if you have a disturbance, um, the reactive control, which has to pass through the spinal cord, would be too late. And so instead, co-contraction is used um, to, to make sure that um, you can remain stable. And so, the, however, the question still remains, is if co-contraction is actually energy efficient? And so does co-contraction actually require less effort than a reactive approach only? And we'll solve this with stochastic uh, optimal control. So um, how do we usually create predictive simulations of gait? Tan has already explained uh, a little bit how we solve this with an optimal control problem, where the goal is to find a control input for a system with dynamics, which is dependent on the state, the input, and some noise epsilon. However, commonly this uh, noise is ignored, and then some objective is minimized, and some task P is performed. And so this is valid for a linear system, but we already showed that this is not valid for nonlinear systems, such as human movements. So instead, what we have to do is we have to take into account this, uh, this noise to make accurate predictions. And so then we have to, instead of calculate the objective exactly, estimate it using noisy episodes. And so now what, what we do to investigate uh, co-contraction is we look at this simple problem of a mass that is held um, connected to a pendulum, uh, which is a refulu joint. And so you can think of this as holding some mass in your arm while having your elbow um, resting on some, uh, some surface, and then there's noise added to the system. But if there's no noise added and this system is entirely deterministic, it's very easy to just keep the mass there because you don't actually need any input uh, for that because it's an equilibrium. But in case that there is noise, um, this position is actually unstable. And then it means that you need some control input uh, to keep this mass upright. And so our questions are, does co-contraction actually minimize effort in a system with uncertainty? And what is the effect of the different components of the muscle and the tendon uh, on co-contraction? And so basically, why, what, what, cause, what in the muscle causes co-contraction to be optimal? And so um, the system what we looked, that we looked at is an arm uh, with one degree of freedom, where um, noise was added to the acceleration, as you can see over here, which was modeled as uniform noise. And then this system was uh, operated with two identical um, muscles, which are two element heel type muscles with um, identical parameters and opposite moment arms. As you can see over here, we have activation dynamics of force length and force velocity relationship. And the tendon is modeled as a, um, as a quadratic spring. And then we also, to investigate the different MTU components, created simplified uh, muscle models namely one without activation, um, one with a linear series elastic element, 
and we removed uh, this contractile element entirely and also had either a linear or a quadratic series elastic element. Then uh, the stochastic optimal control problem that we solved was to find a controller U of T for a dynamic system with noise that minimized the square of the muscle stimulation, which is the, the muscular effort, while remaining in the upright position. So we bounded um, the angle of the arm to a certain maximum angle that we also varied. And the controller structure uh, that we optimized had two components, the open loop component U0 and a feedback component to remain in this upright position with a zero velocity. And then we optimize both U0 and the variables K. And so if then, if in our final solution U0 is equal to zero, it means that no cone contraction is optimal. So it's optimal to use only a reactive approach. And if U0 is bigger than zero, then it means cone contraction is in fact optimal. And so uh, what we did is first we solve, we fixed U0 at different levels and uh, compared actually what the optimal object objective value. Then we also optimize U0 and K for different noise levels and tasks to look how this influenced um, the result. And finally, we, we uh, also perform this optimization with these different simplified MTU models. So here you see the result of, uh, with the fixed open loop muscle input. So here on the horizontal axis, we fix U0 from to 0, 0 0.05 up to 0 0.2. And on the vertical axis, you see the objective value that we found. And what you see quite clearly is that for every uh, different maximum uh, angle, maximum deviation angle, the objective is lower for a, for a non-zero open loop input compared to the zero open loop input. So that means that co-contraction uh, reduces the objective value more than no contraction. One thing that was interesting is that the trend is a little bit different with uh, theta max equal to five degrees, because here, as you can see that between zero and 0 0.05, it first um, increases, whereas um, for the, all the other uh, maximum angles, there's a decrease. And so it's possible that a small amount of co-contraction not yet contribute, but this is something that will have to be investigated a bit more then uh, the next thing we looked at was the optimal open loop muscle input as a function of this maximum deviation angle and the system noise limit. And what you can see is, again, co-contraction is optimal in all cases except when the noise is exactly equal to zero. And it increases with the noise limit. So it increases with the amount of uncertainty that is present in the environment. The other thing that you can see is that it increases uh, with a decreasing maximum angle. So that means that tasks are more difficult. So when it's um, more important to remain close to the intended uh, trajectory or intended angle, more co-contraction is required than for simpler tasks where more deviation is allowed. Then um, we repeated the optimization with different simplified MTU models. And so I've summarized um, the result in the table below. So we have here first the standard model with a normal contractile element, a quadratic series elastic element, and we predicted co-contraction, which is what I just showed. Then we have a linear model where again, we have the normal contractile element, um, and, but a linear series elastic element, and we still uh, predict co-contraction, but slightly lower than the standard model. And similarly, um, when we have no activation dynamics in the contractile element, but a quadratic series elastic element, we also predict slightly lower co-contraction. And, um, but if we then again remove the nonlinearity in the series elastic element, we actually still predict co-contraction, but at a similar level to when we have the quadratic series elastic element. And then finally, we have these simple models without where we completely remove the contractile element. So basically we model the muscle as a quadratic or a linear spring and we do not predict any co-contraction. And so what this showed us is that the muscle nonlinear mechanics, so the nonlinear mechanics of the contractile element cause co-contraction uh, to be optimal. And like me, this is because uh, shortening is required to generate a force. And so the force velocity relationship 
AC limits the maximum force that can be generated um, at a certain shortening velocity. And so uh, more shortening velocity is less advantageous. And so co-contraction allows shortening in advance. And so this allows for a faster um, generation of force in the contractile element. So uh, to summarize, does co-contraction minimize effort in a system with uncertainty? Yes, it does. And what is the effect of the different muscle tendon components on uh, co-contraction? We found that the nonlinear properties of the contractile element are driving uh, and what causes this co-contraction to be optimal. So uh, some discussion. What uh, we showed is that co-contraction indeed minimizes effort in systems with uncertainty. And since in practice, every system is uncertain because you'll always have some motor noise and you'll probably also always have some uncertainty in the environment. It means that core contraction is in general not inefficient with respect to energy. Also, what it shows again is that uncertainty should be accounted for when predicting movement, because here we show that there are advantages in nonlinear dynamics to generate a robust trajectory that you might not find with, um, with linear dynamics. Um, and in a deterministic environment. And then finally, also co-contraction should not be seen as impaired control, but instead as the optimal solution in an impaired environment. And so, if, for example, one question that you might ask now is if elderly people use co-contraction in walking because difficulty increases. So similarly to our, um, what we showed is that when a smaller uh, max deviation angle, there is more co-contraction, Elderly people in gait might also have more co-contraction in walking because they strive to remain closer to their intended trajectory. Because of fall, um, because due to weakness, a fall might be more prevalent and also could result into worse injuries. Then some implications for movement analysis and prediction with uh, gait simulations. So a big question in when we create uh, predictive simulations of GAID is what is the actual objective of GAID um, to that we use to, uh, to generate our motions. And so from an evolutionary uh, perspective, it would make sense if this was an objective of effort or energy only, and that the optimal solution is a robust trajectory that only minimizes um, effort or energy. However, um, we have not yet been able to, to show that due to uh, numerical difficulties, uh, but this is something that we strive to investigate in the future. And so currently a computationally efficient approximation, um, what we uh, is commonly used is to combine these different objectives of muscular effort, metabolic energy, joint acceleration, and passive torques. And so we would like to investigate um, if we can remove some of these objectives while we if we take into account an accurate uh, model of uncertainty in the environment and in the dynamics. So uh, lastly, I would like to acknowledge my uh, funding sources, both at Cleveland State University and at uh, the University of Erlangen-Nuremberg. And thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you very much, Anne. That was, what a nice talk. Uh, we have a we have a couple of questions for you, and we have a few more minutes for, for the questions before I have to close the session. So um, uh, Jill McNick Gray uh, says, well, that she enjoyed your talk, and she wants you to tell more about what insights she might have gained about the value of co-activation just prior to foot contact in walking and running. Um, can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? The question is, uh, can you tell us more what insights you have gained about the value of co-activation just prior to foot contact? We, we have not um, actually looked at that yet, but from, from what, what I found with this work, I would assume that this co-activation would be there to, to account for the fact that there is uncertainty in and when exactly your foot is going to touch the ground um, and what exactly the surface um, might be. And the uh, next question that I have, and it's actually something that I was wondering as well, uh, how do you think these, that this is from uh, Jacob Banks, how do you think these results would differ in a double pendulum model with biarticular muscles? And I guess I had the same questions 
what would happen if you use a multi-joint muscles in a three-dimensional system where it's not always so obvious what we mean by uh, co-activation of muscles. Right. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. So, so our goal was to really to make the model as simple as possible so that the co-activation could only be explained um, by the subjective of effort minimization. And so that's why we used a very simple system with no uh, biarticular muscles. But it would it would be very interesting um, to see if, for example, there's more activation in the biarticular muscles because they can stabilize uh, both joints at the same time, for example. But that's, yeah, that's a very interesting question. And uh, the last question here that we, that we have before we run out of time is from Dennis Anderson. And he says, uh, can you expand on how the combination of objectives you mentioned at the end relates to the methods you presented? Yeah, um, that's also a very good question. So um, I wonder, so what, what I wonder is if some of these combinations are, are necessary to make up for, are, are able to make up for the fact that you do not account for uncertainty in the dynamics. Um, so, and if by accounting for uncertainty, we can actually create more accurate predictions by only having an objective of muscular effort or metabolic energy, or maybe, um, yeah, a combination of those two. But I, I would find it interesting if we can, if we can uh, improve our models of dynamics um, to remove some of these objectives and to get more, yeah, a more simple, simple objective of gait, to be able to explain gait with a more simple uh, objective. Fabulous. Um, at this point, we are, we are exactly on time. The time is over. I would like to uh, thank again all, all the speakers. I, I learned a lot about probabilistic modeling. That was uh, highly interesting to me, and I hope, I hope uh, the, the audience enjoyed that very much as well. Congratulations once more to Ton van den Bogert for the Hay Award. Well deserved. I'm, I think that was great. The symposium that you put together was also fabulous. Thank you very much for doing that. And I would like to remind you on your chat box, you can see that Lena Ting posted, it's, at, it's posted at 10.03 10 that we have designated the AMTI lounge location two for post session discussions amongst the Jim Hay Award Symposium participants. So if you would like to do that, then, uh, then, uh, then please go there. And there's another message flying in that might be in, Important. Oh yeah, Chris Haas says, congratulations, Tom, and thank you to all the speakers. And that's, of course, uh, 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 you know, I, I, I hope uh, uh, and I think um, echoed by everybody who was part of this uh, symposium. Thank you very much again. And uh, until we meet next year at the ASP, uh, I hope in person again, I enjoy this format, but I think I still enjoy meeting in person better. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you.